Good morning. Okay. We're going to be in the book of Exodus this morning. So uh, if you could turn with me to um, Exodus, and we're going to begin in chapter 32. Um, Exodus chapter 32. It's really good to be here again with you. Um, we are, uh, Brooklyn Bible Chapel sends uh, my family and I with uh, greetings to you we, and, and encouragement to you guys that we are also back uh, meeting regularly with certain restrictions and measures in place as we also try to navigate these weird uh, times that we're all in and, uh, and as we try and fellowship with each other as best we can. Um, I want to also thank Forge Road uh, because you guys sent us, when everyone got really locked down, uh, a Zoom link for your breaking of bread and for your 11 o'clock meetings. And I know many of the people, including myself, at Brooklyn took advantage of that, uh, and you guys seem to be kind of out ahead with that, and we really appreciate it, and I'm, I want to thank you guys for doing that. Thank you very much for that. Um, this morning, uh, in Exodus, we're going to walk through an interaction uh, between Moses and God that occurs after the, the flight from Egypt, Israel's flight from Egypt, um, and after the complete law of God is given uh, to the Israelites, which begins back in chapter 19 of Exodus. Between chapter 19 and our passage today, uh, many aspects of Jewish law get, get covered, uh, including how rights to property are handled, personal injury law, uh, rules about how to administer the Sabbath, a wide variety of sundry laws, which means random laws that are either logical or not so logical, but all kind of just one after another, um, both practical and spiritual, and everything really to do with, a lot of things to do with how the tabernacle gets set up, uh, and, and everything in between. There are ones that we are very familiar with, uh, known as the Ten Commandments, that are given to Moses, written by God supernaturally into uh, two stone tablets and given to Moses to take back to the Israelites who have been waiting for him, and they've been waiting for him impatiently. Uh, Moses returns, as we all kind of know the story goes, to find that his people have forsaken God uh, because too much time has apparently passed since they last saw him, and they have literally built an idol to worship out of fear that he may have run off, uh, or and, and certainly out of pride, and also out of rebellion. Moses becomes extremely angry and shatters the very tablets that God has written on uh, because of his frustration with his people and, his la and, and the lack of their faith. And then later, in desperation and in an act of his own faith, Moses approaches God again. And in reverence, and also with good reason, uh, he requests a second chance from God for he and his people, and God hears it. So with specific instructions from God to come alone and to bring two new blank stone tablets, Moses returns to Mount Sinai to meet with the Lord again. This passage, uh, it has a very special meaning to me uh, that it didn't have a few years ago uh, for a very specific reason. And I want to, I, I trust that by sharing that, uh, sharing the background of this passage, we'll walk through it together, and by sharing my experience with it uh, personally, that we will all be encouraged uh, to draw near and follow God, the God who saves us as Christians. So let's Let's pick up the account uh, in chapter 32, and we'll start in verse 7. And bear with me, because we will jump around, but it will be in order, so just stick with me. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. 
They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone, that my anger may burn against them, and that, may I, that I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation. Skip down with me, if you can, to verses 19 and 20. And it came about, as soon as Moses came near the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger burned. And he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf which they had made and he burned it with fire and he ground it into powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and he made the sons of Israel drink it. If you could once more skip down to me, skip over uh, to chapter 34 and verses 1 through 10. Now, the Lord said to Moses, Cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered. So be ready by morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No man is to come up with you, nor let any man be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and the herds may not graze in front of that mountain. So he cut out two stone tablets like the former ones. And Moses rose up early in the morning, and he went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord commanded him, and he took two stone tablets in his hand. The Lord descended in a cloud and stood there with him, and he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Moses made haste to bow low towards the earth and worship. And he said, If I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go along in our midst even through the people who are so obstinate, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your own possession. Then God said, Behold, I am going to make a covenant. Before all your people, I will perform miracles which have not been produced in all the earth, nor among any of the nations, and all the people among whom you will live will see the working of the Lord, for it is a fearful thing that I am going to perform with you. In late May 2017, uh, I started consulting for a small Baltimore-based real estate company. Uh, After leaving my job as a uh, federal employee where I worked for almost nine years, which came as kind of a surprise to my friends and family uh, around me. Uh, When I went to start and work there, uh, I was introduced to uh, several different people in the company, as it's natural, natural that that happens. Uh, and there was one guy who, in particular, who I was, uh, I was told that I was going to be working with very closely uh, on a day-to-day basis because our work roles had a lot of dependence on each other. The business is asset management and acquiring properties around the city and then managing them uh, and renovating where, where, where needed. Because I know that this message is being broadcasted, and because I know that, that it may end up on your website, and to protect his personal uh, information, for, our, for the sake of our conversation today, I'm just, we're going to call him Malachi. As we got familiar with each other, uh, it became, a couple things became very clear. Uh, it became pretty clear First of all, that both of us were, as they like to say, quote, very religious. Uh, Malachi is a devout Jew, uh, a very observant in God's law, as best as he possibly can be. Uh, He will stop everything he's doing to pray three times a day 
as is prescribed um, for, among many other things, for the restoration of the temple in Israel and a variety of other things in Hebrew, which I can't understand. Uh, he is also very unique. He was very unique and is very unique to me uh, because it wasn't just the case that he was devout in the customs of Judaism, which is frequently the case, uh, but he was also very knowledgeable about the Bible itself, um, uh, which is to say for them, Genesis through Malachi, right? No, no, new, no new Testament, just Genesis through Malachi, which in Hebrew is called the Tanakh. Um, this is pretty uncommon. Uh, when, you, you, when you're religious in Judaism, many times you're, you're very well versed in the customs and in uh, the Talmud, but, but not, not as often is there someone who's really well versed in the actual Tanakh or Bible. I, on the other hand, being as what Malachi would have been referred to as devout in Christianity, uh, was well versed in the reasons behind my faith. Not to say that I'm a professor of theology by any means, uh, but simply that I was able to give answers for the reasons behind my faith um, when we would talk to each other about it and readily able to speak about the topics throughout the Bible, which came as a very big surprise to Malachi. Both of us realized pretty early on that we were both pretty well versed in our positions and that both of us didn't understand each other's positions very well, other than what we had studied kind of in our own quarters. You know, we learn, at Brooklyn we study, right? We have Bible studies, and I know that, that Forge Road uh, does as well. And we learn about Judaism, right? We know about the Old Testament. We know about it. But nothing close, I'm telling you, nothing close to what it's like uh, in reference to when you are actually talking to someone who's well-versed in it, who comes from that uh, area. We study it ourselves, but we don't really know and, uh, about many of the things until we speak to someone from, from that side of the aisle. So as we talked over a period of months, because we worked so closely with each other, we were able to learn a tremendous amount from each other. For me, for example, I began to understand many of the intricacies that kind of get glossed over when, when we study uh, that can't be understood unless someone explains it to you. And I learned about the different types of uh, Judaism, similar to how we have different types of Christianity in our faith. Uh, a wide spectrum exists for them too. You know, for, for example, uh, you, I hope everyone here and, and, and myself, we wouldn't want to get thrown in the same bucket as the Westboro Baptist Church. You know, it's the same for them. They have certain spectrums and that they would want to stay away from. Um, that was actually new news to, uh, uh, to, to Nakam or Malachi as well. Um, he learned for the first time that, that not all of us Christians uh, worship the Pope. That was news to him. He, find that, he found that both very amusing and very interesting that, that, that I said, look, we don't have anything to do with, with the Pope. It also didn't take long at all for debate to start. Our first debate years ago was about this passage uh, in Exodus. And the subject of the discussion was whether or not God would go through the trouble of giving the law this way uh, if his intention was to change it later. And at some point, I eventually point blank asked Malachi uh, the question, was God's law meant to be enforced forever? And if not, what would it take for you to uh, believe that it should be replaced by a, another concept, grace, for example? And hold on to that question for now, because it's going to come up again, but hold on to it kind of in the back of your head for now. And the reason I asked him that uh, was, of course, because I was trying to position uh, myself to make the argument that the law was meant to show man's weakness uh, and, and sin, and not to be f um, intended to be followed eternally, and that Jesus was eventually meant to fulfill the law. That's how I was positioning myself. And my friend, 
as I mentioned, being smart and understanding, at least in part, what I was getting at, had also thought through this scenario before. And he had an answer for that question, which I will also tell you in a few minutes. But back to our passage this morning. Moses has an extensive law given to him by God. Much longer than the Ten Commandments that it's written on the stone tablets that we're so familiar with. You know, the Ten, the ten Commandments we have memorized that encompass and sum up Jewish law in general in very broad terms, but there are several hundred other ones in place uh, and given by God to the Israelites during this time and immediately after in the Levitical law. Um, nonetheless, Moses returns with God's literal writing on tablets, uh, of which we have no practical way of knowing how that got there. We just know it, it happened. Um, and after being in his actual presence, and to find that in short order, the people who he just led out of captivity uh, in Egypt have not only lost their faith in him as a leader, uh, Moses that is, but also in the God who saved them. The people, the people of Israel had forsaken their God and their leader and the laws given to them, and it only took 40 days for it to happen. And you know, as Christians and as people who are uh, relatively familiar maybe with this story, we can think through this and we can see an example of a parallel between God's relationship with, to Israel and our relationship to him through Jesus, can't we? We as people are lost, led astray. Our only hope is in the work of Christ as he died on the cross for our sins. We accept that and we become a part of God's family. We become, when that happens, we become of special importance to him. Uh, but sometimes we like to leave the ranch, don't we? We can have God's planned outline for us. We can, we can know that it's true, but circumstances can come into our lives and, distra and, and distract us. The love of and the pursuit of money can derail us. We can get into the wrong types of relationships that can turn us away from God. First, because of embarrassment, we hide it, and then eventually it goes on and even becomes a sense of entitlement. And as a human and as Christians, we know that God's love is unconditional. We know that. He makes in intentions to us very clear, uh, as clear as the writing on a billboard on I-95, sometimes as clear even as, say, two stone tablets with uh, chisel marks in them. But in the lives of many Christians, and including myself, sometimes it can take less than 40 days to be willing to throw it away. Even as the words of the Israelites who watched as water parted anywhere from 5 to 14 feet in the Red Sea as they ran away from an army who, helped, who held them captive. Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this guy Moses, as for him who brought us out from the land of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. You know, it's like I tell all my... Uh, I have a middle school Sunday class at, uh, at Brooklyn. The Israel, I tell them this all the time, Israel is a, is a well-documented and recorded case study of humanity and its interaction with God. We can know the truth about God. We can love and appreciate him and experience his blessing in our lives. And we are able also to throw it away, even as Christians. And you know, if you're, if you're here today, for example, and there's something stuck between you and, and, and getting your relationship with God back on the right track, congratulations to you. You are a human being. But don't, don't wait until the consequences have to become so high to get confess it and get it off of you, uh, and to move on with God and with those around you. That's the whole point. Uh, you confess your sin, and he will be faithful and just 
to forgive you your sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you've built some kind of golden calf, whatever it is, whether it's completely hidden in your life or if it's out in the open, just like the one on the display at the bottom of Mount Sinai, get rid of it. Pound it up into dust, throw it into a river, get it out of your life, and move on from it quick. That is what God wants from his, us as his children. That's the beauty of how God deals with us, um, and, and, and that's what he wants from us. But as for Moses, back at Mount Sinai, he has witnessed his people delivered from captivity. And, and then he had a miraculous encounter, which we, we don't even get described properly in writing, uh, with God where the law was given to show, uh, uh, to, sh- to show the people that he was there with them. And now the people have forsaken their God and they have moved on disturbingly quickly. Disturbingly quickly. And Moses has broken and shattered the tablets God wrote uh, in a way that is meant to really show the level of frustration that he has. And by the way, not mentioned in our passage because we skipped over it, but it's worth me just mentioning briefly, is the death of over 3,000 people during this exchange uh, as Moses instructed those who wanted to follow the Lord to kill all of those who didn't that we read about in chapter 32. And as a result, 3,000 plus people were killed. Chaos. And in the midst of, of all this chaos and confusion and turmoil and death because of the sin of the people, Moses takes a second trip back to intercede to God for his people. And as we read in our passage earlier, God is actually waiting for him. And he has instructions for him. God has three things that he says to Moses. He has three sets of, of his three instructions for Moses. Number one, go and recut blank stones like the ones you had before and that, that are now broken and bring them back here to me. I'm going to write on them again. That's number one. Number two, Come back up to the place that we met before. Come early in the morning, very early in the morning. I don't want you to have any distractions. And number three, last time you had your servant with you. This time, come alone. Our meeting will be be between just you and me. God is extending an invitation for Moses to go back where he received his first communication from God regarding the law right in front of him. Moses has interceded for his people, and the same God who showed himself and his glory to Moses before will now do it again a second time. The same supernatural writing of stone tablets will occur again, and this time God's going to go a step further, and he will make a covenant with Moses And with the people of Israel. He will not do it for because Israel deserves it. He's not going to do it because they deserve it. In fact, they really they, they really deserve to be left on their own, don't they? Or to maybe have their calf God help them if they get in trouble. God will not do it because they deserve it. Instead, God will record his law on those tablets again, and he will make a covenant with his people because of his grace towards them displayed through their leader, Moses. Because Israel had someone who was willing to be an intercessor between themselves and God and who advocated to them even though they were full of sin, God agreed to show mercy by not wiping them all out and grace by extending a new covenant of a relationship to him that he would promise to keep. It may be also a good thing to reference, just very briefly, uh, the obvious fact that the law had just been given and the consequences for breaking it were outlined pretty stringently. And just in the act of building the, the golden calf 
Israel had immediately broken at least two of the Ten Commandments, which we are all very familiar with. Pop quiz. Which two commandments did he break? What, what, what are they? One and two? Yeah. And for those keeping score, I don't know if one is classified higher than the other, one through ten, but it, the first exact two commandments right away were broken. So, now, I want to take a little mental journey forward in time with you really quick, if you'd be so kind. First, we're going to leave Mount Sinai. We're going to take ourselves out of there, around the globe. Uh, we're going to fast forward a few thousand years to summer 2017 ADE, and we're going to travel inward to the middle of Baltimore City. We're going to maybe take the exit on Moravia Road and get to the middle by way of East Madison Street. We're going to turn left on Center Street and make our way to Mount Vernon to the 500 block of Park Avenue. Walk in, go upstairs, and listen as Malachi, my coworker, uh, dictates and lists this exact series of events that we've just discussed with each other to me in the exact format that we have just discussed it. I listen carefully and openly as my friend describes how God did in fact lead his people out to Mount Sinai after he got them out of the land of Egypt by using his servant Moses, obviously. He brings them into the wilderness where he does, in fact, understand that they will need his guidance if, they were, if they're going to make it as a people group and if they're going to make it as a society, of course, they're going to need his guidance. He understands that, the, that as a people they are weak, right? So he outlines, God does, everything that they should do very carefully. Everything from how priests are supposed to dress, what color they're supposed to wear, how often you should wash your hands in the desert, all the way down to the basics we are all familiar with, such as not wanting things that your neighbor has. These laws were given to Jews as a people, he said to me. They weren't given to anyone else. They were given to us to follow, Malachi's telling me, kind of elevated. And you know, I was thinking about it, and he's right. And God saw the weakness of the people. And sure, yeah, he burned with anger. But when Moses came back to him, forgiveness and communion, what did he do, Alan? What did he do when he came back? I was like, I don't know. What did he do? He inscribed Ten Commandments again onto two tablets. Both of us are starting to get elevated a little bit. So, Malachi says to me, if the law were meant to be put aside in some favor of, of another system, no matter what the other system is, why would there have been so much care and instruction for us to preserve it throughout our history? And I paused again. And you know, I sat and thought about it for a little while. There are a couple things that I could say to that. But for the first time in that moment, uh, my eyes were really opened to the intensity behind the devout nature of those who practice Judaism sincerely. You have to understand, you know, we, we study their history, like we mentioned before. We, we study their Torah and the Old Testament, and it's easy to point out all the mistakes, especially for those of us who spend a lot of time and are able to make a good argument. Uh, but hearing it come from the other point of view, especially from a source that you respect, it opens your eyes if nothing else, to understanding where the mindset comes from. So I stayed quiet, trying to think of a thoughtful response uh, and praying that, that God would give me the right words to say. And as I was sitting there thinking, uh, and kind of, as a, kind of as if he thought that he had me on the ropes, he said, he said this to me. He said, it would take something miraculous for me to believe that God intends for us to stop following the law in favor of another system of belief. Now, remember the question that I brought up in the beginning of, of the uh, meeting? It was at this point that I brought it up. 
in our conversation. Okay, Malachi, I got it. So we know, we know and we agree that God's law is perfect. We know, and, and obviously, no one can keep it, as evidenced in the fact that you just explained to me that two commandments were broken pretty briefly after they were given by the vast majority of the newly established nation of the Israelites. We agree, okay, we agree that God showed his mercy to Israel by not wiping them all out uh, for their sin and having broken the law so egregiously, of course. Then he showed his grace by making a new covenant with them about how he would continue to reveal himself to them as they traveled and how he would remain with them. You mentioned that it would take something miraculous for you to believe that God's intention would be for everyone, including the Jews, to then leave following that law and relying on it as the means of staying reconciled with God in favor for a new way uh, at all, right? So what would it take? And then he was quiet for a minute, and he thought about it. And I, I can see as he looks at me that he also wants to respect me. Uh, just like I want to respect him, both of us trying to uh, explain our God one to another. And then he said, well, it would take another miracle. And it would need to be a miracle the size and the magnitude that happened at Sinai. That's their benchmark. It needs to be on that order. That's where it was given that's the size it would need to be again. And then he went on. It would, need to be, it would need to match the magnitude of how God literally came down from heaven to the top of that mountain and explained to us personally what he wanted from us and how we should live. And he says to me, until God does a miracle on that order again, I'm not convinced at all that he intends for us to deviate from following that law as it was prescribed to us. We were both quiet for a moment as we let Malachi's words sink, sink in. And then he piped up again before I could say anything, and he said to me, I know what you're going to say. And I said, well, Habibi, which is good friend in Hebrew, at least we're on the same page. And after that, we both looked down at our phones and realized that we had stayed in the office talking since 5 and it was now 9 p.m. And as we both realized that we had missed several calls and texts from our wives, I said to Malachi, my wife is going to kill me. And he said, mine's going to kill me too. I got to get out of here. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God, because by the works of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and by the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified as a gift by his grace through the re redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because the, in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus this would not be the last conversation I had with Malachi. And even though we parted ways in business two years later, we keep in touch to this very day and are very, very close friends. In fact, he trusts and respects me um, in, 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 in many more, in, more, in many cases, more than those in, in the same circles as him. Please, Forge Road, please pray for, uh, for my friend. 
and for all of my close Jewish friends who live in Baltimore, that they would accept Jesus as their Savior. And uh, pray for me also that I would be sober-minded and in close touch with God uh, so that when a conversation comes up with any of them, I say the right things because it appears that outside of the four walls of, uh, of my church in South Baltimore, I have accidentally fallen into a ministry of relationships with the Jewish community in Baltimore and in the country of Israel. And as for the law of God, and as, of his, uh, and as for his commandments, let us rejoice together that he has shown us the mercy, that we are condemned by the law, but that we are not, have not received the punishment for it. And let us be greatly encouraged that he has shown us grace by giving, by giving us the opportunity with a, of a new relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ, and that the weight of the law is not on our shoulders. The same God who worked a miracle at Sinai took away our sin at the cross of Calvary. Thank you so much for having me back with you this morning. I really appreciate it. Let's close and we'll return the meeting back to you guys. Dear Heavenly Father and Lord Jesus, we thank you for your Son, Father, that you sent him here. Father, we thank you. We thank you also for your history. We thank you that you have given us your word. Father, we thank you that you did come down and reveal yourself before at Sinai. And Father, just as you made a co covenant with your people Israel, you also made a covenant to us when you sent your son down from heaven to die on the cross for our sins. Father, I pray that if there is anyone here who doesn't understand or know that, who doesn't feel that unconditional love this morning, that, that today they would, would be the day that they take advantage of that love and, and, and accept your son as their savior. Father, I pray for uh, the devout religious people who love you and want to serve you, but who need your son, just like we do. Father, in your own way, please reveal yourself to them also. Even as we understand the power it took to save us, we know you are completely capable to do it for anyone. So we pray that, and we thank you for this time with each other. We ask that you uh, dismiss us with your blessing and that you give us all here safety uh, as we interact in daily life with, with those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.